Dearest and most loyal India, Hello and a good morning to you, my most crucial colony on the Empire. It is with high honour and the highest of pleasantries that we unilaterally have you join the war effort that has now exploded all over Europe. I know I'm using a feather to write this and not a telegram. Well, I am just that old-fashioned and pompous. After all that dreadful hullabaloo about the Austrian Archduke, we are shocked at the people of Belgium being occupied by an aggressive empire. We have subsequently declared war on Germany and its allies. We now bring forward all our realms to the field of battle. I look forward to seeing the sepoys in the trenches. Please have a few complimentary packs of your Darjeeling tea, which we took the liberty of having you harvest and pay for. Cheers, and God save the King. Your best friend and benefactor, the British Empire. You know what? We should declare home rule. Yeah, we should. There probably isn't any other empire that has claimed colonies, taken resources, and used subjugated indigenous labor like the British Empire. The year 1857 saw the grandmother of Europe, also known as Queen Victoria of the House of Hanover, named as Empress of India after the failed Sepoy Rebellion against the British East India Company. The company acted as a governing power on behalf of the empire and then stepped aside for London to directly rule. Although many freedom fighters put forward valiant efforts to counter foreign occupation, there was no truly unified effort for rebellion until the outbreak of the Great War. Known as the War to End All Wars, it was the first war of its kind to truly pull all parts of the world together to fight each other. Empires, colonies, kingdoms, republics, and foreign legions would spend 40 million lives of civilians and soldiers for a war caused via foreign entanglements, nationalism, militarism, and imperialism. At the start of the war, India was considered the crown jewel of the British Empire, where riches, diversity of religion and people, along with culture, were all found. The various presidencies and kingdoms of the Indian subcontinent were mobilized for the war effort, with little to no consultation about the opinions of those being sent to the front. Still, many activists and independence leaders at the time, such as Gopal Krishna Gokhale, believed that faithful service during the war would at least guarantee home rule, or autonomy for India as a whole afterwards. Other leaders, however, such as Lokman Nitilk, wanted to drive the British out of India entirely and secure Swarajya, or sovereignty, as its birthright. A mathematics teacher by profession, Derek became one of the fiercest independence activists and social reformers of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, printing his own newspaper to reach the masses and forming alliances within the Indian National Congress Party to bolster the independence movement. However, the British tried Derek for sedition in 1908 and sentenced him to six years imprisonment in Mandalay, modern-day Myanmar. He was released in 1914, the year the war started. One-fifth of the Indian army was Punjabi Sikhs, and were thought of as the most courageous and valiant warriors of the Indian subcontinent. They were known to most frequently leave the trenches and openly charge the enemy. Seven expeditionary forces were made from various ethnic groups of India, and they all served in various campaigns across European, African, and Ottoman theaters. Over one million Indian soldiers served during the First World War, and approximately 74,000 lost their lives. Despite horrible conditions on the front and racial prejudice shown by their commanding officers, Indian troops were regarded as the most loyal, compassionate, and determined, with a field marshal later claiming that without India's help, Britain would have lost both world wars. However, colonies were still colonies to their empires, and the people's station hardly improved over the duration of the war. Indians immigrated to various parts of the empire to look for work and start new lives. Yet, they continued to face egregious and humiliating hardships. One such event was that of the Komagata Maru. This episode was named after the Japanese steamer that was carrying British Indian Punjabi immigrants to Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. After leaving Hong Kong in April 1914 and sailing for more than a month, the ship arrived in Canadian waters, only to be forbidden from allowing passengers to set foot on Canadian soil. The Canadian government used anti-immigration exclusion laws to keep the ship in the harbour until July. The passengers were starved of food and water, and a riot on board against Canadian police made things worse. The ship was forced to leave with most of the passengers and eventually reached Kolkata, where police had orders to detain the passengers. Another riot erupted, and 22 people lost their lives at the hand of law enforcement. Outrage among the Sikh community and other Indians around the world over the event led to the planning of the Ghadar Revolt. With plans being sent via Canada to India, several regiments of the British Indian Army were to mutiny against their commanders. The belief was that if the Indian Army rose against their small number of commanders, India could be freed. However, 
The plans were revealed by English intelligence, and the leaders of the planned rebellion were liquidated or otherwise imprisoned. Even after meritorious service during the First World War, home rule was still not granted to India, dashing the hopes of the moderate Indian activists. Fears of another military rebellion led Parliament to pass the Rowlett Act, which required the arrest of independence leaders and severely curtailed civil liberties. This led to several peaceful protests throughout the subcontinent. The most fateful protest would be at the Garden of Jallianwala Bagh in the Punjabi holy city of Amritsar in 1919, where Brigadier General Reginald Dyer led non-Punjabi troops to the Garden. Dyer thought that by using soldiers of a different ethnic group, there would be less compunction in acting against the crowd. Blocking the exit, he ordered his troops to fire into the crowd of unarmed civilians without warning until their ammunition was spent. The casualties put forth by the British government was at around 400, although numerous other estimates put the total at well over 1,000. The massacre horrified India and the world, and even Winston Churchill, known for being racist against Indian people, expressed his anger at Dyer's actions. Dyer and Punjab's Lieutenant Governor Michael O'Dwyer, however, received praise from many in Britain, believing they had put down a rebellion. The duo launched a reign of terror throughout Punjab. Citizens were forced to crawl on all fours, forbidden from approaching white Britishers, and were to be shot on sight if they were going against curfew. Loyalty pledges were also made law, with students forced to pay respect to the British flag every single morning. Many moderates throughout India became Indian nationalists, severing all ties with Britain. Nobel laureate Ramindranath Tagore returned his knighthood in protest of the massacre, and Mahatma Gandhi shifted his focus from home rule to full and complete independence of India. Even after all the sacrifices made by India to safeguard Allied goals in the First World War, the British Empire did not change its stance towards the subcontinent and continued to treat its colonies as a whole as disposable. The Amritsar devastation was the breaking point and started what would be considered one of the most powerful independence movements in modern history. The fight for India's right to self-determination and freedom had begun once more. Yes, sure.